episode of Astrologers Chatting Over Coffee. And today we're going to talk about a topic that seems kind of astrological. It's actually about wine grapes. And there's a very long tradition of connecting astrology to wine and to growing. It, you know, it's not surprising because astrology is the study of the natural world and grapes grow in the natural world. So, of course, it's a natural. Now, why would we as astrologers write about wine country? Well, because we moved 3,000 miles <laughs> to be here. And our, and our love of wine preceded our move. That wasn't the whole reason for our move. And I find it very interesting that, you know, we've written over 30 books, mm. and we are finally writing our first book on the topic of astrology. Yeah. And as we were developing the chapters in this uh, introduction to astrology that is sort of part of our calendar or an offshoot for a planetary calendar, mm. uh, we really had some fun with some of the concepts that are related to astrology, but also bring it together with wine. A lot of what we do is synthesis uh, work, and so we always find that you know they all come under the same umbrella as lifestyle. You know, so when we moved here, we thought we were going to do the same things that we did on the East Coast, and we were just going to do them here, out of our office on the West Coast. But then we looked around at the beauty everywhere and said, really? We're not, we're not going to do something that gets us out into this beautiful nature world here? You know, and you can't swing a cat by the tail without hitting wine grapes. So, right. you know, wine is infused in, in just about everything that everybody who lives here does. Mm, yes, as I've oftentimes said, the only three topics of discussion are food, wine, and weather. In fact, if we'd come here and weren't interested in wine, we'd be incredibly bored. So luckily, but we are also herbalists after all, and herbalism is about plants and, and about how plants grow. And, and there's a very long tradition of using wine in combination with herbs for nutritional you know, purposes. Many, in fact, many of the old formulas is, is you know, this much herb dissolved in wine and taken twice a day. That was a very common thing because it had the alcohol, it had the antioxidants. You know, had the necessary acid to help the digestion, combined with the herbs, and it potentiated the effectiveness of the herbs. So it's not really that surprising that you know we'd be interested in the, in the two things. Well, and it's interesting because out of astrology, you know, astrology sa assigns rulerships to all of the plants and right. all of the things, uh, you know, in the areas of your life and the things that you come into count encounter, you know, and and there are health. <laughs> Uh, rulerships and all kinds of things that we use in our practice with our health astrology or our relocation astrology so that we, you know, have these rulerships so that we know this relative strength and, or possible weakness of a particular planet and a particular sign in someone's chart. And so the herbs having these rulerships was one thing, and we thought, well, what is, you know, a grape? <laughs> you know, it's but, not that far away from right. juniper berries or right. something it's else a, like that. A, it's so. a berry bush that done, has done very well for itself. <laughs> and we were fascinated when we first moved here to discover that there is, I mean, of course, we had been concerned about organic farming and organic products and, and all of that, even on the East Coast, because of our background in natural health. But then when we moved here and we realized that, of course, we expected a lot of the wineries to be organic. But when we found out about biodynamics, mm. that was really exciting for us because, you know, mm. it's based on the work of Rudolf Steiner. And, of course, you've got the Greek god Bacchus of the god of grapes. And then you've got Demeter. The Demeter Society mm. is what sort of enforces the biodynamics here in wine country, you know. So, you know, if you've got the gods going with you, you know, yes. or the planets or the gods and... You know, it just was this synergy that we just thought was fascinating. I mean, after all, remember, you know, Benjamin Franklin's quote about, you know, wine, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, wine is, is the one true proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. You know, but it's also that connection to the heavens. After all, in 1811, there was a uh, comet, and they just called it the Great Comet. That was its name. And the reason was it was in the sky for 270 days. A tremendously wow. long time. It was, it was just extraordinary. And during that year, the 1811 vintage is known for being extraordinary. In fact, the Chateau de Camp, 
the great Sauternes of that year, had tremendous longevity and was tremendously fragrant. And the Veuve Clicquot Champagne, that champagne was actually considered the first modern champagne ever created. And this was from the 1811, you know, vintage, uh, because of this comet that was in the sky for 270 days. It was extraordinary. So there's a long, long tradition. In fact, I'll give you a quick little hint about um, wine tasting. And this is something that the wi big wineries in France use, the ones who use biodynamics. When you're tasting wine, you will find that the wines are more fragrant and more flavorful when you taste during a fire moon or an air moon. And in, in other words, every two and a half days, the, the, sun, the moon goes through a different sign. And it goes through, you know, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer. So it's going from, you know, air, from, you know, fire to earth to air to water every two and a half days. We have found in our personal experiments that it's true that on those days when it's in the air or fire signs, it, it's more fragrant. When it's in the water or earth signs, it's definitely suppressed. Now, the flavors might still be there when you're tasting it, but remember, the nose can detect up to almost a billion different scents. The palate actually gets a lot more. Everyone says it gets five flavors. It gets a great deal more. We have a hard time expressing it. The most people can express is about five flavors. And the reason is, when we taste things, it comes up through our brain, from the lower part of the brain, through the section that creates words. So literally, flavors from our tongue can make us speechless. <laughs> we, can't, we can't enunciate it. But for some reason, with no nose, we're better about detecting it. Because it's a little higher in the body, I guess. A little higher in the brain. Odd <laughs> stuff, but the way we know no, this. It's fascinating. We're still doing a lot of the research, yeah. and it's just interesting to find these little nuances of things, especially when I live with this, this man who synthesizes and philosophizes and figures out these weird connections but you know they you know he tests them and they bear out fruit so to speak so, <laughs> so it's always fun yes. let me say never boring but one day we were sitting around and we decided to say well what planets what celestial bodies relate to which grapes well, let's talk a little bit about rulerships first, because, you know, there's a certain logic to rulerships, and that's how they developed in ancient times. You know, people saw a quality in a thing or a plant or a time of year that reflected the, the strongest qualities of a particular planet, right? Right. So <clears throat> these had... Um, a relationship and you could see that oh every time when the sun is in Leo you know the sunflowers bloom mm. or whenever yeah. the you know the sun is in S Scorpio maybe the chrysanthemums are the only flowers that are left blooming or mm. things like that these are observations that are really based on logic which you know a lot of people if you say astrology is based on logic they you know they kind of laugh but you know we know that yes. that's true right. You know, Based same as herbalism, yeah. you know, uh, I love, and, and I'm talking a lot about flowers because we live in a very abundantly green and floral mm. area, you know, but I love the story that the plant hydrangea tells, you know, because it's kind of the litmus test of nature. All hydrangeas are going to be blue unless you feed it an acidic plant food. And that's the way that you get to be, uh, get it to be pink or red or white or a different color. And so um, when you, if you don't do that, they'll all revert back to blue. Right. Well, that's the litmus test. Right. Litmus paper turns pink in acid and blue in, right. um, in an alkaline environment. So you can see these are logical things. So we thought that the type of grape not just the grape from the color and the shape and the size of the leaf and everything, that would be one way that you could assign it to a particular mm -hmm. planet, um, but also the qualities of the flavors when it's developed into a varietal. And how it's used. How is, it, how is the grape used by people? How is it appreciated? Because you know our relationship with grapes is very complex because the plants that we have today have been mutated over a long period of time. What's funny is that because we controlled the mutation, um, the grapes that the Romans drank 
were essentially the same Syrahs and Pinot Noirs that we drink today because they've controlled this so carefully, but the plants have mutated so that we have this very you know, synergistic relationship between humans and grapes. And so we looked at what are the major popular fine wine grapes and how do they relate to the major planets? Because you have asteroids, you have stars, you have little things float, lots of moon, you have how many moons around Jupiter. No, what are the big guys? Who are their main players? Who are the players on the chessboard? And how do they relate to the main grapes? Now, of course, we had to start off with who? The sun, right? And who would the sun be? Chardonnay, it's the most popular white wine. And it's funny, because when you see Chardonnay in the vineyard, you know, they all start off green, and eventually the grapes turn, and then it's, the reds will go over to the red. But Chardonnay will go over to that beautiful little yellow, and then as it gets close to ripe, it becomes this beautiful translucent globe with little sunspots on the surface that float around. It's really a gorgeous grape. And if you've ever been in a restaurant, you know, you're in New York City, you're down at Soho, and someone brings you, you know, it's, it's candlelight, and they bring you a glass of Chardonnay, a big globe, and it gets there, and it's this glowing globe of gold. That's the sun. Well, and out of the white wines, it is the one with the most rich gold mm. honey color. Right, yeah to it, similar to the attributes of the sun. So you can see how this attribution kind of goes right. hand in hand. And what's funny is that you can also take, um, you can take Chardonnay, for instance, in the United States, and, and, and you know, primarily in California, the Virgo state, you know, where they grow so many grapes, they um, primarily grow Chardonnay by itself. You know, it's grown just by itself and they ripen it completely and it makes a nice big yellow golden grape. But in France, they don't do that as much because they have a shorter growing season. So what they do is they blend it with other grapes because they need to round out the flavors. And it's interesting who the other grapes are because if you look at the sun, who's closest to the sun? Mercury, right? And then who is our other big player in our sky? The moon. Now, who would the moon be? We postulated that the moon would be Moscato. Moscato is a big golden globe. It's big and it's a watery grape and it's sweet and it's fragrant. Well, and that sweetness is one of the qualities that really drew us to assigning it to the moon mm. because, you know, the moon is emotional and, you know, loves, you know, a certain amount of comfort and indulgence and you know, that Moscato is really like a dessert, practically. It's a treat, so mm. and you can see how it relates to the And moon. you can also mis make Moscato in different styles, too. True. Just like mom. <laughs> just like the moon relates to mothers. And just like mom, you can get moms in lots of different styles. Well, and the moon changes. The yeah. phases of the moon yeah. are constantly moving and changing. So it's very versatile, versatile and, and mutable. And then the other planet, the other player who's close always to the sun, of course, is Mercury. And who, who do we assign to Mercury? We assigned Pinot Noir and Pinot Blanc. The two of course, groups. it has to be two because Mercury is <laughs> the twins. rules Gemini and right. Gemini is the twins. The so, twins. Yeah. And one is the white version of the grape and one is the dark version of the grape. Right, two sides of mercury. Right, and they're both rather, you might, I don't want to say thin in flavor, but they're more delicate. They are. I, I, I say thin. When you look at it in a glass, mm. it's, it is a thinner. Mm. It doesn't have that quality that mm. it sticks to the sides of the glass when you uh, swirl it on the glass. And, you know, it has that lighter kind of touch to it. So it's like here, and the finish is not very long, so it's... It's kind of like mercury. Yes. Like you have it, oh, that tastes good, and then it loses interest and it's gone, and then you need another sip. Right, and in fact, many times they blend Mus um, Pinot Blanc with Chardonnay to, to right. add things together. And also the Pinot Blanc, the Pinot Noirs, many times there's multiple different vineyards mixed into one batch in what's called a red burgundy because they actually blend well together because the Pinots work well together because it's the Virgo side of it and Virgos love to work with other Virgos because they like having people around them who are equally efficient or at least picky. <laughs> <laughs> I love assigning Riesling to Venus, mm. not just because I'm a Venus girl. I have three planets in Libra and what can I say? 
But Venus is the love of mm. indulgence and uh, finer things and beauty. And the Riesling is just a lovely white wine. In fact, out here, sometimes it's referred to as the breakfast wine. <laughs> <laughs> it's light. It, it, there's many styles to make the Riesling. But it's just a feel-good, you know, easy to love kind of energy in a in a wine grape. Yeah. And it, I was like, we're, we're, this is actually one of the chapters in our book. And I actually, I think one of the lines about Riesling in the book is that there's no wine that brings a smile to so many people's faces as Riesling. It's true. Many people, it's one of the first wines they have when they're learning about wines. Well, isn't the Latin word for smile or laugh right. recess so exactly it's uh, no coincidence right? exactly it's very suited and now Mars there's a couple of different grapes that we, we could refer to that but we picked Malbec and the reason we picked Malbec is that Malbec is a very appealing grape it doesn't have a lot of tannin so it's it's it it ages pretty quickly um, it's very enjoyable and that's like Mars Mars is all about the hormones and the thing about hormones is that they're real strong, and Malbec is real impressive, but it doesn't, it's not long-standing. You can't age a Malbec a real long time. It doesn't do any good. You know, it doesn't have that staying power. It's like surge, and then, okay, we're done. Well, I like a straight Malbec, but it's interesting to me that Malbec usually or often is added to a blend to kind of fix an imbalance right. there. And doesn't Mars like to fix things? Yes, he does. He likes to be active. And the other thing yeah. about the other grape we, we thought we could actually combine, we could choose for that also be Syrah. They're very similar in terms of that. They're kind of beefy and meaty, but they don't have long staying power. Yeah. You know. And then Jupiter, the big guy. Who do you assign to Jupiter? And of course, it's going to be a red grape. Merlot. Merlot. It has to be. The big red berry. <laughs> it's big and juicy and luscious and everything wonderful. We're so yeah. heartbroken about some of the mm -hmm. bad press that Merlot has received. I mean, the effect of that silly movie yeah. has really changed people's attitudes about a wonderful, wonderful wine variety, all that Merlot. And yet the Merlots that are around today are much more to it are probably because of the movie. People probably. People up their game. And see, that's why Jupiter is helping. Yeah, exactly. And the thing about um, Merlot is one of the things that's a very social grape because it, you know, it's very appealing. It doesn't take a long time to age, though you can blend it with other things well. And the great thing about Merlot is you can say it easily. If you're, that's true. If you're in a bar with a pretty girl and you want to impress her because you've been drinking beer all, you know, all your whole life, but you want to have a, a glass of wine, you want to have a glass of wine with something you can pronounce. You don't want to say Cabernet Sauvignon, Gewürztraminer. <laughs> you want to be able to say, give me a Merlot, please. We didn't assign anything to Gewürztraminer because... <laughs> You know, the DUI test in, in wine country is you have to be able to say Gun Lach Bun Shu and, right. and then you're not drunk. Exactly. So, But speaking of Cabernet Sauvignon, totally a Saturnian mm. grape. You know, it's it's got bones to it. It mm. really has an edge to it. It defines the wine. It stays on your yeah. teeth. It etches to your your teeth. You know, I mean, there's so many things about the association with Saturn yeah. that make it just a perfect fit. And it's partially that it ages. Um, Cabernet Sauvignon ages. It's very high in... Um, tannins, which is basically a sulfur compound, but allows it to age. Now realize, why do they always consider Saturn the old man of the zodiac, or actually the old woman of the zodiac, because it's a little bit more feminine in some ways, or the old woman, old man, it's not really one or the other. Why? Because it takes 28 years for Saturn to go around the sun and return to the same relative spot in the sky, or the same sign as it was 28 years before. Jupiter's only 12 years. No, do you remember being 12 years old? Of course, everyone remembers being 12 years old. It's a great year. It's why? Because Jupiter's returned to where it was when you were born. Saturn, everyone remembers when they have their Saturn return at age 28 because Saturn's come back and you really feel like an adult for the first time. And the sun doesn't come out for a year. Yeah, or so. Me too. <laughs> right. So I get to do Uranus. Oh, yes. Uranus is that quirky planet that spins on a different axis. Yes. So it does everything a little bit differently. Well, there's this grape called Viognier, uh, and it is a tricky grape. They only started really growing it seriously uh, in maybe the last decade or so. 
uh, because it's so hard to work with. It's a, the skins are horribly bitter, and if you don't just kind of coax the center of the grape out of the skins, you get a terrible flavor. So mm -hmm. there's a lot that goes on uh, in the making of a Viognier varietal, and um, so Uran is, is the perfect match because it's unusual, yep. it's not made that very much, uh, and it takes a lot of quirky different techniques to make it well. And with Viognier, it's oftentimes mistaken because when you smell it, the freak, it's very fragrant on the nose, Floral. very perfumo, right? Exactly. But then when you taste it, it tastes almost like a Chardonnay or a Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, more like a Sauv Blanc, I think. Very, yeah. very structured. Well, that's also like Uranus. Uranus was mistaken for a star for a very long time before in, what the, uh, in the 1700s they realized, oh, no, this is actually a planet. Right. You know? Now, um, Neptune. Neptune, remember, is a big, big planet, and we've assigned Neptune to Zinfandel. Why? Well, because it's a favorite in California. See, eventually, California loves Neptune, god of the sea. We had this huge, long sea coast with these fantastic harbors, Neptune, god of the sea. And what does Neptune rule? Wine. <laughs> Um, drugs were, of course, the, probably the biggest cannabis producer in the country, and movies. <laughs> and dance and horses. And video and games and right horses. Escapism. I mean, yeah, this is, these are all Neptunian things. Right. And Zinfandel has been adopted as California's grape. In fact, we thought it was the native grape for a long time. Well, and I think that, you know, even though white Zinfandel isn't white, um, <laughs> you know, that was right. a lot of people's entry wine right. varietal. Yep. You know, so that Neptune, that desire to sort of get outside of yourself or, you know, to, to escape, you know, that goes so hand in hand with wine in the wine world, you know, for that to be associated with Zinfandel is also a really good match. Yeah, it, you know, it, it's, and the thing with Zinfandel too, you know, it's, it ripens early. It was very popular during Prohibition because of that reason, because it ripened early, because they could ship it fast. They could ship it to people early on. But it was also that it's one of these things that it's all in the right spot. It's the right weight. It's the right flavor. It's just it's kind of like Californian and Neptune. You know, it's wherever you want it to be, it will be. And now we come to Pluto. Pluto. And I don't care. Nobody can tell me that Pluto is not a planet. Yes. Okay? I'm a Scorpio, but Pluto is a planet and will ever be. But it's moons. Absolutely. Come on, really. What are you talking about? Um, so Pluto is, however, a petite planet. <laughs> petite planet, yes. And so than Mars. for other reasons as well, we assigned it to Petit Verdot. Yes. Yes, exactly. And what the thing about Petit Verdot is it ripens very late in the year. And it means the little green one. So in, in Bordeaux, they normally keep it on the vine until like when it rains and then when they have a problem with the, the um, tannins have been washed out of the skins of the other grapes, they'll harvest the petite verdot when it's not quite ripe and add it to the tanks to replace the structure, the tannins and the color, it's got deep, deep color that you need to, so the, the wine will age properly. So it has this hidden power that it was the way we always have viewed Pluto because Pluto was discovered when? At the, at the eve of the atomic age. Pretty powerful symbolism. Well, and if we're blending all of our various modalities together, mm. uh, Pluto is the modern ruler of the number eight section in our Euro Bagua, which is right. the area of power and helpful people. Right. And Petit Verdot just wants to help out the blend. That's true. And the thing about it is the atom is very tiny. It's the atom bomb is very, very small, and yet it affects this huge area. And it's the same thing with the Petit Verdot. It's a little grape. They add maybe 1%, and it transforms it's true. the entire wine. And that's the thing about Pluto. We've always seen it as transformable, transformative. And if, what's interesting is we oftentimes have talked about, um, astrologers have talked about, part of our community, as beginning the eve of the atomic age during the world wars and such. But what they didn't realize the significance of at the time was it was also the beginning of the computer age. Electrons. 
You know, the, all, the little, all the little dots, all the little, you know, the, the plus and minuses, you know, closed or unclosed, that little bits of information that have transformed the world and through laptops and through the emails and through the web. That's the other part that it was. It's the power of the small to transform. And that's Petit Verdot. So those are the grapes. That's your astrology. We hope you had fun with our little sort of blurring the lines between all the various yeah. things that sort of interest us in our, in our astrology. And hopefully you just think about the fact that astrology permeates every aspect mm. of life. And if you think about it long enough, you'll come up with an idea like Ralph's. Right. And, and of course, you can um, assign a lot of different grapes to uh, Saturn or to Jupiter, I mean, because there's thousands of grapes. I think years ago, they did a, a research in Italy in which they had categorized 2,000 different individual varietals. They'd identify them with genetics, and they had another 2,000 to go they hadn't done yet. Oh, my. So there's a tremendous number of different grapes. And uh, what's interesting is that in viticulture, the grape that's most important, or the planet that's most important, is considered to be Mars. Well, if you look up at the sky and you see Mars, Mars is a little red ball. What's a little red ball? A grape. That's a grape. So I tell you, living out here in wine country and seeing the natural world, seeing how the seasons evolve, uh, watching the plants grow, seeing a new vineyard going in and feeling the sense of hope that you get from that has taught us a huge amount about astrology. And we, we've been astrologers for over 40 years now. Yet when we moved out here, we started learning about it in what you might call in an experiential way that we, you can't do in the cities. Maybe it comes from being in a place where you can actually see the planet <laughs> at night. Yeah. So I, I think it's about the fact that the symbolism, you know, so much of the symbolism you see a, a, about around you is, relates to the symbolism that's found in our, in the uh, the planets and the astrology, the the way in which the hierarchy functions and the way in which nature functions. Because astrology is, after all, the study of the natural world. So if um, you like wine, get out there, taste a few. Right. Tell us what you think of our. Uh, uh, unions of the wine with the planet and uh, see you again next time for yeah. astrologers chatting over coffee. Thanks so much.